Today, Radical Personal Finance is Friday, and that means live Q&A. Welcome to Radical Personal Finance, a show dedicated to providing you with the knowledge, skills, insight, and encouragement you need to live a rich and meaningful life now while building a plan for financial freedom in 10 years or less. My name is Joshua Sheets. I am your host. I am your guide. I am your confidant. I am your friend here in this journey with you today. Today we do live Q&A as we do at the moment every Friday. Each and every Friday at Radical Personal Finance, we do a live Friday Q&A show. Works just like call and talk radio. You call in and talk about whatever you want. Ask a question. Um, share with me your comments, your feedback. We brainstorm about anything that you are interested in doing. And so if you would like to join me for a Friday Q&A show, you can do that by becoming a patron of the show. Go to patreon.com slash radical personal finance, patreon.com slash radical personal finance. Sign up to support the show there on Patreon, and that will gain you access to one of these Friday Q&A shows. And I do these Friday Q&A shows each and every week in which I can arrange my travel schedule and arrange the appropriate technology to do so. We begin today with Sarah and Tampa. Sarah, welcome to the show. How can I serve you today? Hi. Um, so my husband and I are renting a house, and we've been saving for a down payment on a home. We were originally hoping to reach that goal by early 2023, along with paying off the rest of our debt, which consists of 12000 in student loans that are currently on pause by the federal government. However, our landlord called us earlier this week to let us know he has terminal stage four cancer and might die soon, which is extremely sad, of course. Um, and it was really nice of him to let us know, but he's offered to sell us the house that we're currently renting from him off the market. So if he hasn't put it on the market, um, if we don't buy it, his estate will most likely put it up for sale. But to avoid him just selling the house from under us, he he was nice to offer it to us. Um, if we buy the house, it will wipe out our savings completely since this is earlier in the timeline than we were planning, and it will also delay us paying off our debt. So I have two questions for you. Do you think it would be financially wise for us to move forward with trying to purchase the home? Um, we were already pre-qualified. I went ahead and moved forward some looking into some financing options. And second question, what advice do you have for navigating this situation specifically as it relates to negotiating with someone who's dying and being sensitive to that? Yeah. How much debt do you currently, do you still have? We have 2000 in student loans. And again, those are on pause Got because it. they're federal student loans. How much is your household income? Per year gross, 105,000. And how much more or less is this house, house worth, worth, do you think? I think it's worth around 250,000, but he's trying to sell it to us for 275. Right. Do you like the house? We do. I mean, we we have a lot of memories in the house. Um, it does. It is pretty old. It would require a lot of fixing up to do. Um, but we love our neighborhood. We love, you know, we've lived here for a little over four years. So we would be very happy to like stay in this house and then put some work into it and fix it up. And our neighborhood, you know, it's in a place where it would potentially go up in value as well. Do you have any personal challenges that would make renting a different house difficult, such as do you have a bunch of children? Do you have a bunch of big dogs, anything like that? Or are you pretty easygoing renters? We're easygoing renters. We have no children and no animals. So it doesn't get any easier than that. Let's begin with number two, advice for navigating the situation. Um, you've probably done just about all that you can do in terms of, I'm sure that when he said, I have stage four terminal cancer, you expressed appropriate symphony, sympathy. <laughs> you expect you expressed the appropriate sympathy. <laughs> Let's see if I can get my words out tonight. And, um, you know, you inquired about the situation, et cetera. There's really not more, much more that can be done, right? At the end of the day, every single one of us ends up six feet underground, um, there's no reason not to deal with that straightforwardly. 
And uh, without question, people die of cancer all the time. And uh, I don't think it should be weird to deal with people or talk to people who are dying. I think it should deal with, with it straightforwardly and not engage in some kind of strange tiptoeing around the subjects, etc. Now, obviously, some people have a hard time talking about it, but um, I, I don't think it should be hard for you. And also, it's not your problem. Um you certainly appreciate he's done the, the the good thing by coming and simply sharing with you that, hey, this is what's going to happen. But you don't have any responsibility towards him that is different um, because he's probably going to die very soon than, than you do right now. And so I don't see any reason why you need to take on any burden of that other than just the natural, normal human sympathy that you'll have for his situation. So with regard to navigating it, I think you need to start by doing exactly the same thing you would do at any other time, which is simply think through your own situation, think through what is best for you, try to analyze it as as we're doing right now, and then decide, okay, if this weren't the factor, would I want to buy this house and under what terms would I want to buy the house? None of the scenario with the property is his problem. Um, so none of it, sorry, none of it is your problem. You don't need to take on anything. And if you are a couple, two people, uh, without children, without dogs, then you, you basically have no problems in the rental market. Uh, I have problems, <laughs> right? I've got four children and two dogs. I, I am a, I'm a hard uh, tenant to find a, per, in a suitable place, but two people, it's relatively easy to find a suitable place. So you don't need to worry about being out on your ear. Uh, and so let's talk about financially wise. How much down payment do you currently have? We're planning to put 15000 down. But how much do you have currently? Do you have 15000 we have around 18000 and by the time we would get to closing, which based on conversations with him, we'd close sometime in November, we would have a little bit more cash on hand by then because I'm getting a small bonus next month. Congrats. Awesome. So, And we'd be able to save around $2,000. we have been saving around 2000 per month. Yeah. So uh, the first thing is, is it financially wise? Can you afford the house? I would say almost certainly. Even if you bought it for $275,000, if you have a household income of $105,000, if the only debt that you have is $2,000 of student loans, and if you've saved up- uh, 12000 sorry. Oh, okay. I must have written, written the wrong number down. And if you saved up a, a down payment, I don't see any reason why you should delay buying a house if it's a good deal as compared to buy, waiting until you pay off the student loans. When a deal presents itself, I think you should assess it afresh, right? So if you're in a situation where, hey, our goal is we're paying off student loans, we're paying off student loans and we're saving down payment, paying off student loans and saving down payment, but all of a sudden a great deal comes along, then I think you should pause and say, is this deal good enough to motivate me to actually move quickly? And there's no reason why you shouldn't change your plan if you come across a great deal. Uh, To me, that's a, a... a rational approach to changing circumstances. Uh, A lot of people don't like to do this, right? You get a certain plan and you say, this is the plan. We're going to pursue this plan. We're going to follow these baby steps. We're going to get out of debt before we buy a house. Great. Fair enough. Um, I appreciate people who have a clear plan, but plans should be changed if circumstances change. And so what you're describing is a thing where circumstances can change. And at that point in time, you rethink through the plan. So just because your previous plan was pay off the debt first, I don't believe you're beholden to that. My big questions would be, number one, is this a good deal for you? Do you like the house? Is this the house that you would pick, especially knowing its condition? Is this the house that you would pick if you were going back out in the market yourself? Now, there is tremendous value to liking the neighborhood, to having been there for four years, to not having to move. That Those things are valuable. But you should, as best possible, ask yourself, would we choose this house again based upon these terms? You should know that you're in a situation where you could potentially solve his problem. If he needs to sell now because he needs to raise the cash out of the property, 
rather than leaving it for his estate, there's no one better for him to sell it to than you. And so what I would do is for his sake, I would make this decision very quickly. I would think through, do I want to buy this house or not? If I do, you've already gotten pre-qualified. That's great. I would, I would do the deal very quickly. But in exchange for doing the quick deal quickly, I would make sure that the deal was something that was exciting to me. If he doesn't have to market the property, that could potentially save him months that he doesn't have. Uh, now, we live in a world right now, especially in Tampa, Florida, where the market is very hot. And so he's certainly aware of that, that if he puts the property on the market quickly, he can get something, get somebody interested quickly. Does he have, do you have a contract with him uh, up to a certain date at the moment? Well, our lease, um, we renewed our lease May 1st. So, I mean, we technically are still under our rental agreement, but I'm sure there's terms in there where he could cancel it at any time. <laughs> you, would, you should check the lease and find out what the lease says and see what language is actually written in there if he wanted to sell the property. Uh, because this could play to your negotiating favor, where if he has to keep you in there until uh, the date that your lease terminates and then sell the property, or if he has to sell the property subject to it being inhabited by his tenants, then that um, that could bit weigh in your favor because you could solve a problem for him by uh, simply changing the contract and buying the, the house. I guess without going into greater depth, I would say it sounds to me like you like the neighborhood, you know what's wrong with the house. I would make him an offer and I would make him an offer to close quickly on it. I would make him an offer with you, you at this point in time, you should know more or less everything that's wrong with the house. So maybe you can expedite the inspection. Uh, you can try to I guess if you're financing it, though, you'll still have to do that. But you could try to expedite the deal and make him an offer. And if you think it's 250, but he wants 275, then make him an offer for a little bit less and say, "Listen, um, we know we know you want to sell the property quickly. Probably, you know, it's a very hot market. Probably, if you put the property on the market, you could uh, sell the property for more money. Uh, after all, you know, it's a desirable property." I would then clarify, of course, you have a problem with the lease, right? That we have a, ten, a, a rental contract here. And depending on what the terms of the lease say, consider what your rights are there. But we would actually like to buy the property. Um, but we don't quite have all the money together that we would like to. And it's just not worth 275 to us. Um, so we would love to make you an offer for whatever you believe is fair, right? 235. That'll save you any cost or hassle of marketing the property. We'll close quickly. We'll close in X number of days as quickly as we possibly could and make him an offer that you would be really thrilled with and then see if he takes it. If he wants it, great. If he doesn't want it, I wouldn't get attached to the house. Uh, I don't think that this is a great time to be buying a house uh, if you can avoid it. Uh, we're clearly in a very, very hot seller's market. And so if you're flexible like you are, uh, I would wait for the market to cool and for a better deal to emerge. So this might be that better deal, but I would negotiate diligently to try to see if you could get good numbers. Great. Thank you for all that advice. So all of that information that you just mentioned, would I include that in my offer letter to him you're proposing? I wouldn't necessarily include it in an offer letter. Um, it depends. So everyone will have their style. What I would do is do it face-to-face -face and present my offer. I would present a check with it in some appropriate way, right? Maybe you have a contract. Maybe you have a uh, go ahead and grab a, a sales contract. Ask a friend of yours who's a real estate agent to give you a, a, a standard contract, something with it, and I would give him a check as a down payment. Um, Basically, I believe in win-win negotiation, and I don't think that you lose in most places by simply playing things honestly. And so I don't claim to be the world's greatest negotiator, but the language that I just said is language that I would use. I would make it very clear that you like the house, you think it's a great house. I'd make it very clear all of his options, that he could probably put it on the market very quickly and probably sell it. It's a great time to sell a house. I would also make it clear what my interests are and that if he wants to do business with me, here's what I can offer. And if you don't want to negotiate on price, if you don't want to offer him his asking price, which I think is perfectly fair, what I would do is I would emphasize the negotiation on terms. And in this case, when he's got stage four cancer, especially if he wants or needs the money himself now, 
then that's one of the best things that you could do. You can simply negotiate based on terms and you can say, I'll give you a lower price, but I'll close fast. I'll waive you know, certain issues. We know everything that's wrong with the property. Uh, we're already pre-approved. I can close as quickly as X number of days and make the deal go fast for you. So to me, that's honest. And I think people appreciate it. And I think that it helps you to feel good about negotiating for what you are willing to do. Um, That's something that I have found to be helpful and effective by simply clarifying for the person that here are my interests. If I'm willing to pay top dollar, I'll I'll pay top dollar, but negotiate something else. If I'm going to try to get a discount on the money, then I want to make it clear why I'm doing that and try to emphasize the things that I can offer that would help somebody to take my potentially lower dollar offer. Great. Thank you so much for expanding on that. That was really helpful. Yeah. Thank you so much for that advice. My pleasure. My only comment would be don't feel pressured to make this particular deal work. If you like the property, go for it, but don't feel pressured. Um, You're in a situation where there are plenty of houses available for you to rent, plenty of houses for you to buy, so you should feel no personal pressure. Nick in New York, welcome to the show. How can I serve you today? Uh, Thank you, Joshua. Can you hear me? Sounds good. Great. Uh, thank you for all you do. I discovered you last year and I really appreciate uh, your insights and, you know, in terms of personal finance, as well as how the the faith component interacts and relates to all of that. Um, my my question is the following. I am a salaried W-2 employee and my salary is rel- relatively high. Uh, I've been doing a bit of consulting on the side, but very minor, like a few thousand dollars each year. Uh, there is an opportunity for me that there may be a, an opportunity where For the next couple of years, I may go into the tens of thousands through that consulting while keeping my full-time job. Uh, And I've gotten a bit of conflicting information online regarding of whether uh, creating something like an S-corp would be better for me from a tax perspective, as opposed to keeping the sole proprietorship right now um, and paying my top tax bracket for that extra amount. So I I wanted to, to get your insight on that. What is the nature of your consulting? Um, I, I work in IT, so um, yeah, I, I consult regarding okay. um, various IT topics. I don't see any really compelling reason to bother getting involved with an S corporation um, for the sake of a consulting business. The primary reason why you would establish a corporation is if you face some kind of liability exposure. Mm-hmm. And as a consultant, a professional consultant who doesn't have employees, doesn't have premises, doesn't have, um, isn't creating something that's generating some kind of liability. You don't have any major significant liability. So I don't re- see any liability reason from what you've just described just now why you need an S corporation. An S corporation will not save you um, much, if at all, on your income taxes. It can only really save you something on your employment taxes. And in your situation, you're already maxing out the, if you have a high salary, you're probably already maxing out the social security wage base. So let's talk through the tax rules and why someone chooses one over the other. If you pay yourself as a sole proprietorship, simply filing a schedule C, then all of the profit from your business will be taxed as profit from a sole proprietorship, which means you're going to pay income tax on the profit in the year that you earn it. Also, that you're going to pay self-employment tax if you have not already maxed out the wage base on the profit. And so that self-employment tax comes out to be 15.3%. When you start an Mm -hmm. S corporation, you have two potential tax savings opportunities that are driven by the fact that you can delineate some of your income as salary and some of your income as profits. And those profits are paid to you as dividends. Now, there is no specific rule that says, here's how much in an S corporation you can mark to be salary and here's how much you can mark to be dividends. The IRS guidance says, when you have an S corporation, the salary should be based upon what the the normal salary for that function would be in the business. And so if you're going to earn $50,000 of profit, it would be very unusual to ever have a business where you have $5,000 of salary, where you could hire somebody to work for a $5,000 salary and a $45,000 bonus. 
And so if you got $50,000 of income, it really doesn't make sense to do that. You can't do that. And if it gets audited, there's a good chance it's going to be pushed back. Uh, and you're going to have to recharacterize the income. Um, so would it be reasonable to pay yourself on $50,000 of profit, a $30,000 salary and $20,000 of dividends? Probably. And there's no specific rule. I hear accountants often talk about 50%, right? They'll often split it and say 50%. Now, that not always, right? There are good arguments. If you're making $800,000 of profit, you might very well get away with paying yourself $100,000 salary and $700,000 of dividends. But the idea of tax savings is on your dividends, you can potentially, if those dividends are taxed at a lower rate, you could potentially save some income taxes on those. And then also those dividends are not subject to self-employment taxes. In general, it's self-employment taxes that are the big savings. But if you already have a high salary, then that's not going to be a big savings for you because you're already going to be maxing out your Social Security wage base, which just simply, simply leaves you with your Medicare contributions. So uh, long story short, I think that the costs of establishing an S corporation, the costs of maintaining the S corporation, the costs of following the corporate formalities and maintaining those corporate formalities for something that's a side gig where you might make a couple tens of thousands of dollars is more of a hassle than it's worth at the moment. If something changes, you come back and you got up six figures, now things di are different. But from what you said, it's probably more the cost and the hassle is not worth the savings. Right. So would you, I mean, you, you talked about liability. Um, is there another form like an LLC where, you know, there's less of uh, paperwork and um, let's say recurring costs and headaches where, you know, it, you think it would make sense or would you just advise me to just keep my sole proprietorship given the nature of, of my sort of, I guess, limited consulting and side income? Yeah, I would keep it simple myself. Um, the answer to your question is yes, you can establish an LLC. An LLC has fewer corporate formalities, and then you can elect for that as LLC to be taxed as an S corporation. You will then have some liability protection. You will have uh, fewer corporate formalities, although you should still follow good corporate formalities with an LLC uh, if you actually care about liability protection. Uh, and so it is simpler, but still it's a cost, it's a hassle, and it's something that has to be wound up and wound down. And from what you're describing, you just got some side income here, and I would just file this as a, as a, as a sole proprietorship. Uh, it's really not going to be that big of a savings. If you sit down, sit down with the amount of money that you expect to deduct, it's not going to be that big of a savings based purely on profit. Now, to complicate the answer, what you would probably be most well served at by doing is asking yourself, are there some fringe benefits that I can run through this particular entity that I can run it through that are benefits one way that wouldn't be benefits another? And that question is more complex than I can answer right now. But let's say that you wanted to set up for yourself a, uh, a plan, a fully reimbursed uh, health plan, because you're looking and you have a, a, a child who is going to need extensive orthodontia, and you'd really love to re deduct, be able to deduct uh, you know, all $8,000 of his orthodontia bills. Well, then you can go ahead and set up a, uh, a completely uh, reimbursed medical plan but you need the right entity in which that kind of plan is allowed. That's when I would go ahead and, and set it up. But there are benefits to having a sole proprietorship, right? A sole proprietorship has its own unique set of benefits. Uh, the biggest benefit of a sole proprietorship is that losses are fully deductible against active earned income. And so if your business activities generate paper losses in some way, that can be an exceedingly valuable tax benefit that you lose when you establish uh, an S corporation or an LLC taxed as an S. So my answer is I would stick with simple and I would focus on making the business good. Then if in the future you see that, hey, this is continuing, I'm going to be doing more consulting, et cetera, then definitely come back and reassess next year. But from what you described, my instinct is keep it simple for now and then reassess next year if you see if you have more consulting contracts coming up. Got it. Much, Joshua. My pleasure. All right, we go to Peter in the same state. Peter in New York, welcome to the show. How can I serve you today? 
Hey, Josh, how are you? I'm well, sir. How are you? Good, good. Uh, quick one for you. So travel related. I, um, I'm hoping you have some advice for how to get better packing while you travel because I'm really bad at it. Okay. Where are you going to go and for how long? Uh, no immediate trips planned now, but I just got back from a two-week trip to Europe and uh, brought too much stuff with me. All right. Is your suitcase still fresh in your mind? Is it still literally packed or can you remember what you took? I can very much remember what I took. All right. So begin by making a list of everything that you took and then ask yourself, of those things that I took, how often have I actually used them? And for me, this was something that I did repeatedly when I was an, a new traveler. I, I did this exercise where I packed a lot of stuff and I'll give a sell a very embarrassing story, but I have not always been a lightweight traveler, <laughs> not lightweight at anything, but I know I've always been a lightweight traveler. I remember one time we took a family vacation, uh, and we were, it was a driving vacation. We were going to be gone for something like 25 or 30 days, something like that. And I remember that I was a, a brash teenager and my arrogant claim was, I'm going to wear a different outfit every day. And I brought 31 different outfits, the number of outfits for the day. I don't even know how I had 31 different outfits, but I did. And so I've traveled heavy. Uh, but over the years, once I re realized that the pleasure of my trip would dramatically improve the less luggage that I had, then I began to focus. And the first step that I did was simply make a comprehensive packing list. And I wrote down, I, 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 I'm sure I started with some recommended packing list, but I wrote down everything that I would want to take uh, systematically on a list. And then I started packing from that list. And over time, I used the same list every time. This was useful to me as a novice traveler to help me recognize that uh, if I packed from the list, I could pack very quickly. And I knew that I never needed more than what was on that list. And so if I just went down my checklist, check, 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 I knew that when I walked out the door, I would have forgotten nothing because everything that I possibly would have needed was on that list. It spurred my thinking and it made packing fast, easy, and, and not a hassle. The second thing that I started to do was just notice what I used. And if I didn't use something, I would just start leaving it behind. And the more you do that and the more you realize how lightweight your stuff is and how that makes most trips better, not all trips, but many trips, much better by being lighter weight, you have more motivation. And so just start by dumping the things that you didn't use, that you don't use, and systematically saying, well, I don't need that much. You can... After you've done that with what you have, I think your next step, and let me pause for a moment, take another trip with a lighter load and see if your travel experience is improved. Again, I don't believe that all travel experiences are improved by packing lighter. There are times in which extra baggage is simply not that big of a deal. If I'm going away for the weekend and I'm driving my car, it really doesn't harm me if I I take a big suitcase that I place in the trunk of my car and then take it out at one hotel, stick it there, open it up, do my thing, and then close it, put it in the trunk of my car and drive home. That's no better or worse because I took a smaller bag. But when you introduce airline travel, when you introduce multiple airline travel, uh, multiple stops, when you introduce multiple hotels, what you realize is that every single step along the way, the, the luggage weighs you down. If I were a solo traveler uh, and I were traveling for an extended period, I would never have more than what I could have in a small backpack. And the idea being my backpack is always with me. And so then you're totally mobile. You never have to figure out where to leave your luggage. You never have to leave your luggage with the bellhop. I would just pack in a backpack that was always, um, always with me. The time that I did this the most effectively, I proved the value. I don't remember well enough the leader measurements, but years ago I had a uh, just a standard Jansport book bag. It was my book bag when I was in in high school. So it was the classic Jansport single two pockets, just the standard book bag size. And I traveled for a month, uh, four weeks in the Philippines with just the clothes that I and with everything in that bag. 
And it was one of the best trips because I always had my stuff. Um, there was never any lugging of anything. It fit everywhere. I could be super mobile and it was wonderful. And so as you lighten your load, you can persuade yourself that, hey, this is actually worth doing. Now, the next step is start looking for a little bit of, well, first, you may not need the advice, but start looking and saying, how can I simplify this packing load? So think about what clothes you wear and what clothes you don't wear. I basically wear the same thing virtually every day. And I learned years ago that I, for example, I don't wear t-shirts. I don't find t-shirts any more comfortable uh, than button down shirts. Some people do. I think that's fine, but I don't find them to be any more comfortable for me than button down shirts. And I'm more self-conscious when I wear a t-shirt. So I feel more comfortable in a button down shirt. And so I learned years ago, I just buy Brooks Brothers, non-iron, button down shirts, 100% cotton. And I'm, that's just what I wear. And it works in all situations. I'll go for a hike wearing a Brooks Brothers button down non-iron shirt and I'll put on a tie and go out to a fancy event. And so for me, when I, if I'm going to travel, I'm going to take three, maybe four shirts maximum. They're all going to be variations on exactly the same theme. And I leave everything else behind. So that's, that's my solution, but no, no travel hacker would choose what I personally choose. If you're lacking inspiration, go on Reddit and go to the One Bag Forum on Reddit. There are also a number of websites, but the One Bag Forum on Reddit is really good, where there's a lot of people analyzing their gear and finding all kinds of cool solutions. The world of travel stuff is full of amazing solutions for um, uh, for problems you didn't know you had. The Pack Hacker website is very good where you can go on and you can see, for example, they have a, a bunch of great videos, but their one bag solution for a digital nomad. How could you fit everything into this one modestly sized backpack? And you'll start to see that there are some basic themes. So you choose a color scheme. So ideally all of your clothes work with one another. So you can minimize the number of clothes that you have. You choose clothes that are versatile and you, um, uh, make sure that they work in multiple situations. You, you choose clothes that are quick dry so you can wash them yourself and you can downside as much, uh, downsize as much as you want or need to. Your luggage will look different if you are going on a business trip, suit and tie every day, but the same principles simply apply. Uh, and so those are the resources that I would use. And then look at what you uh, look at what you have and try to figure out solutions that work for you. For me, the bane of my existence is shoes. I wear American size 16 shoes, which means that I have two problems. Number one, my shoes are massive and they take up far more space than virtually anyone else's shoes do in any kind of luggage that I have. And so if I'm going to take an extra pair of shoes, I have real trouble fitting much more than the shoes. The second problem that I have is I simply cannot find the shoes that I need anywhere. The only place that I can get shoes is through mail order, obviously with the internet. And so when I travel, I, I can't just go without shoes because I, I, unlike if I had a perfect you know, size 12, I could be able to get a pair of shoes anywhere, then um, I don't have that, that blessing. And so you have to look around and say, how do I solve my problem? And so for me, I try to find versatile footwear. Your situation may be totally different, but if you'll follow those steps through of simply making a list of what you use, systematically noticing what you're not using on the next trip, leaving those things behind, realizing that your life and your life, your travel style is actually better uh, without it, uh, without those things, uh, and then looking for solutions and then trying the fancy solutions that other people find useful. Uh, that's the process that I would use. We go to David in Alabama. David, welcome to the show. How can I serve you today, sir? Hey, hey, Joshua, thank you for taking my call. Um, I, um, I'm interested in international diversification. I've, I'm in the process of getting a second citizenship and second residency in uh, Panama and, and Mexico. And um, <clears throat> so I feel like I'm pretty safe on the physical side of things as far as diversification. I'm more interested in this about in this call about uh, talking about um, finances. And uh, I've been reading a lot about different banks internationally, and I'm looking at maybe open up a brokerage account overseas. But I wanted to talk to you about um, uh, opening up an international LLC I'm looking at Nevis to do something like that. And I didn't know if you could talk about the advantages and disadvantages of that. 
Okay. Those are two very different things. Um, banks, international brokerage accounts, and an international business, those don't necessarily follow one another. So let's begin with banks and brokerage accounts. Why do you want to open an offshore bank account? One of my main, main concerns going forward are, are the potential of capital controls. Good. In the United States. Okay. Have you yet, have you already opened an international bank account? Do you have anything existing now? Yes. Okay. So at the very least, you have Panama, right? Because correct. if you're doing the Panama Friendly Nations visa, you'll have at least a Panamanian bank account. So good. So how much, so what, what do you next need in your international banking that you don't currently have? Um, no, well, I, I, you know, with the business that I have, um, you know, it would be nice to be able to have a PayPal or something like that attached to, uh, my account, but I don't know if that's possible. Okay. Um, a business, you know, I'm really looking just maybe to invest in real estate or getting involved in, um, um, a, you know, again, open up a brokerage account and uh, diversifying that okay. way. All right. So, and by the way, I'm not picking at you, but these 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 things actually are not as straightforward as you say. Okay, so for banking, it sounds like what you would like to have is you would like to have the potential for more diversification with your merchant account. You'd like to be able to collect money from your customers with with money that's not necessarily flowing through the United States. Is that true? Yes. Okay. So that's different than just another international bank account. Now, um, brokerage account. Why do you want an offshore brokerage account? Uh, so I can invest in other uh, other uh, stock markets. Okay. And so that's also straightforward. We'll come back to that in a moment as well. Now, an international business or, uh, entity. Why do you want an international business entity? Well, again, I don't know about I don't know if it's necessary for me, but um, but if if you know. If I if I was going to open up a brokerage account uh, overseas, I, I'm one, I'm wondering if it would be best to have an international LLC attached to that, or should or should I do that more on a personal level? All right. So I will not be able to answer your questions here in a satisfactory way because uh, the the this is where you do need some personalized advice. Uh, so I'm going to tell you how to think about it in a way that will help you hopefully arrive at the best conclusions, but this is where you will need some personalized advice. Now, to begin with, uh, kudos for taking action on establishing some offshore residencies and working on the path towards a second passport. Do you continue to live full-time in the United States? Yes, sir. All right. So that will complicate matters because there are actually can be substantial downsides to your owning um, an offshore company, especially if that offshore company is used for active business if you are living in the United States. What you would want to read about is what are called the controlled foreign corporation rules. And basically, it imposes a higher level of difficulty and work, and in some cases, a higher expense for owning offshore corporations that you're the majority shareholder of while you are living and working in the United States. It will also add complexity to your life. And so you want to be cautious not to add complexity that's not necessary, that's not actually getting you something that's genuinely valuable. There is a cost to every step of an offshore process. And so you want to be thoughtful of the costs and make sure that you're doing the things that are going to actually serve you, but not just go out and randomly start corporations and start companies and randomly start bank accounts in, in ways that aren't going to help you. Um, with regard to banking, I would say your decision process is, number one, you need, if you're concerned about capital controls and currency controls, number one, you start with just at least one bank that's offshore. And once you have one bank that's offshore, then it starts to be less weird to you. Uh, was it weird before you opened your first offshore bank account, the idea of going abroad to open a bank account? 
No, sir. Wasn't for you. Okay. You're yeah. unusual. So most people find it strange, weird. They feel like they're doing something sneaky. Wasn't for you. So the second thing is you look at your banking needs and you ask yourself, what do I need and want with my banking needs? If you've got a million dollars that is sitting in your bank accounts in the United States and what you're concerned about is moving your million dollars outside of the United States so that it is hopefully outside of potential future capital controls, then you want to you, you want to think thoughtfully. And with a million dollars, you can go to the world's best banking jurisdictions, right? You can go to Europe, you can go to Asia, you can open a top top level private bank relationship and take your million dollars and and be treated very, very well. That's different than ten thousand dollars. With ten thousand dollars, the plan is different. So you with banking, you need to start by how much money do I want to bank and then choose the jurisdiction that provides you with what you need. The second thing you need to consider with banking is what currencies do you want to hold your money in? Do you want to hold it in U.S. dollars or do you want to diversify now? Do you want to keep it in U.S. dollars but diverse, have the ability to diversify later or do you want to diversify now? No right or wrong answer, but that's what's going to drive the banks that you choose. The second thing with a brokerage account um, the brokerage account that you choose will be driven not by uh, where you want to go, but rather what markets do you want to invest into. So if you're trying to purchase shares that are held in an Asian um, uh, on the on an Asian stock market that you can't invest in easily through your U.S. based entities, and that is absolutely the perfect scenario for you to go and establish an international brokerage account. But you'll want to do that in the jurisdiction that will best allow you to engage in the investment activities that you're having there. You mentioned in passing real estate, different than the United States, investing in real estate using an offshore company is often not a good idea uh, when outside of the United States. In the United States, there's really no downside except some cost and some complexity to investing in real estate through an entity instead of owning it per personally. And there are substantial asset protection benefits, substantial privacy benefits that can be achieved by using an entity. That's not necessarily the case, though, in many other countries. And so what you need to do is, if you're going to buy real estate, start with what country am I going to buy real estate in? And then get advice locally as far as what would be the best way to do that. And your ownership of personal real estate in your own name goes a lot farther outside of the borders of the United States than it does inside of the borders of the United States. In addition, um, if if privacy is something that's important to you, you gain additional privacy with your money by owning the property personally. Whereas if you establish a business entity then that owns real estate now, you have additional reporting requirements to the U.S. government. And so you may not want to establish an offshore company for the purposes of, uh, of um, owning real estate. Third and final thing, what about an offshore company for doing business? Here, um, you'll, need to, uh, you, you'll need to clarify how big is my business and how much can I move offshore now and how is and, and then the jurisdiction that's appropriate for you will emerge. Uh, establishing an offshore company is exceedingly easy. You can go online, you can find plenty of people who will sell you all the paperwork and officially register and file a company that's held in an offshore jurisdiction. Having an offshore company that actually does something for you is much more difficult. Uh, for example, First step of having an offshore company is, can I open a bank account for this company? That's much more challenging than you might expect. And so you want to be very thoughtful with the jurisdiction that you choose if you need banking that's abroad. Now, here it's going to relate to your current business. Are you trying to open an offshore company that's going to be either a subsidiary of or a holder of your current company? If so, things are simpler. Uh, it, from, it's from a banking perspective, you might continue to do some banking in the United States. You may not need um, foreign bank accounts. I've advised people uh, frequently to establish an offshore company 
have that offshore company hold a U.S. LLC, but to do all of their banking and their merchant processing in the name of the U.S. LLC. It's basically invisible to your clients that you're offshore. Uh, thus, your merchant relationships are simple. PayPal doesn't flag you. Stripe works with no problem. Your bank accounts work with no problem. And just the entity is sitting there. And so in that situation, you can go to whatever cheap offshore tax haven you can find that'll work for you. On the other hand, if you're actually working to set up a, robu a robust second system, right? You want a genuine offshore company. You want that offshore company to have all of its own separate paperwork to not be connected to you. You want that offshore company to have its own bank accounts. You want that offshore company to have its own merchant processor so that if for some reason you needed to change your US operations or if you just wanted to have the, the diversification for another project, then now you're going to invest much more heavily in going to the appropriate jurisdiction that will allow you to, to do that. And that's where you get into the benefits of a Hong Kong company as compared to a Nevis company. That's where you get into the benefits of a Dubai company versus a, uh, versus a, uh, uh, a Belize company. And here you're going to want to pay a lot of attention to blacklisting, uh, which countries are blacklisted and which are not. Uh, you're going to want to pay a lot of attention to tax treaties. Where are you doing business and generating income and such? Uh, and do you need a country that is that has an appropriate tax treaty for based upon where you're generating income? And it does get much more complex. And so if, if those parts of your offshoring plan are parts that involve significant sums of money and if you are ready to pay tens of thousands of dollars to set up that infrastructure then you will want to get personalized advice on each of those pieces uh, because um, but don't just get them unless they're actually necessary and useful and thus worth paying the money to put them in place and to keep them in place got it thank you very much my pleasure sir and congratulations for taking action and i hope that you never need any of those plans. Thomas, welcome to the show. How can I serve you today, sir? Thomas, you're up. I hear the crickets. Let's... Hi, Joshua. There we go. Thanks you're for in. Taking my call. My pleasure. Hello? Yep, sounds right. good. Great. Um, with regards to your recent podcast on being too conservative, uh, how would you think through how much of your net worth would you put into speculation? Is it uh, just anything over a certain amount or? You kind of have a percentage of assets or um, yeah, just w what's your process on thinking through that? And how would that change if you were expecting a period of lower income because of a lifestyle choice? There are people who have developed formulas that I think are worth considering. For example, one formula that I've heard um, very well-respected businessmen say would be something like, don't invest more than 10% of your net worth in any one particular uh, venture. And the idea here is you can avoid getting wiped out if you can, if you never invest more than 10% of your net worth into any one particular venture. Uh, I see the wisdom in that. And I want to be cautious. I want to be aggressive, but cautious. I want to be cautious about violating good practical advice such as diversify, don't put more than 10% of your net worth in any venture. However, I have a hard time myself committing to that advice specifically and committing to it as a hard and fast rule without appreciation of the other opportunities. And, he, and let me give some examples that I've considered as I've pondered this question. Life is risky. And what happens is there can be many people who sit back smugly and say, oh, I would never take that risk over there, when in reality, their life is full of risk. So the, my favorite example, I think having a job is unnecessarily risky. To have 100% of your income generated by one employer, that's crazy, right? That's crazy because if one employer decides that, that he doesn't like you anymore, you lose 100% of your income. Now, obviously, it's not crazy because that's just a normal scenario. And so you can acknowledge, hey, it's risky to have all of your income in one scenario. But on the other hand, well, what's the alternative, right? It's a good job. It pays me money. And if I lose it, I'll go get another one. 
So now look at something like investments. Most people have a massive percent of of their net worth tied up in one investment. Most people, middle class people anyway, not wealthy, but most middle class people, the major financial asset that they have is their house. Now that changes as you go up and becomes a retirement account, which is usually a little bit better diversified, but it becomes, it's their house. And so um, you look at that and say, that's crazy, but it's not because it's their house and there's a use to it. There's a need for it. And that's what fits at this stage of their life. Now let's talk about other diversification. Let's say that you applied a wooden rule of diversification. Well, what do I observe when I review most people's finances? Some guy comes to me and says, I have a half a million dollars in my 401k. And so on the one hand, you look at it and you say, well, all of this is, is, um, is super well diversified. Maybe he owns mutual funds. He owns shares of thousands of companies in those mutual funds, um, which great. But then I look at it and I say, yeah, but this is all in dollars. Right? He doesn't have any exposure to foreign currencies, and if the dollar collapses, this guy is screwed. Now, obviously, that's excessive, but how much of your portfolio should be in any one particular currency? Should no more than 10% of your portfolio be in dollars? What about the risk that if you're earning in dollars and you're spending in dollars and your investments are all in dollars, if something happens to dollars, your whole life falls apart? Isn't that a risk? And so my point of saying these examples is not to say that the guy who has half a million dollars in his 401k all in dollars is behaving dumbly. He's not. Um, my point is to say that the, the idol of diversification can become an idol that you can't ever satisfy because I can always introduce a scenario in which your, your, uh, your portfolio falls apart. And so what I believe is that the most powerful tool to analyze this is to look at it through a couple of other lenses. Number one, you should look at it through the lens of scale and ask yourself, where am I at this particular point of time? A young man comes to me, says, I've saved $100,000 and I am convinced that there's a really good business opportunity over here. If I buy a franchise or if I invest my money into this thing over here, I could potentially turn this $100,000 into quite literally millions. I'm going to tell him, go all in. What's the big point? What's the big problem of losing $100,000? Go all in. If you think it's a good opportunity, go all in. And set, maybe maybe go 90% in. But it doesn't scare me if some guy comes, he's got $100,000, and he's a young guy. It doesn't scare me for that guy to come back and say, you know what, I'm going to, to go all in on this business opportunity. Go all in. On the other hand, maybe I got a guy who's you know 60 years old, and he's got $10 million, and he's been accustomed to living on a $10 million lifestyle. He's not so active in the business world. He doesn't have the energy that the 20-year-old guy has. He's not as aggressive. And he's living on the $10 million. Well, here, I think it'd be really silly for him to go all in with $10 million if he doesn't need to. Here, I think diversification is much more prudent. And so I think it's a matter of where are you? Look through the lens of scale. Uh, where, where, what does this money actually mean to you? $100,000 buys some security, but it doesn't, it's not wealth. $10 million is genuine wealth. Um, it's far more than security. And so there, the, 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 the difference of lifestyle of losing $100,000 versus losing $10 million is very different. And so I think appropriate analysis includes a lens of scale. The second thing would include what would be the impact to life and lifestyle. Um, You know, back to, again, I think about in the context of of risk and aggressiveness. I'm still a young guy, right? And so I think about what would happen if I risked it all and I lost it all? What if I went all in on something and I lost it all? Well, I haven't yet made as big of a fortune that it wouldn't be a dramatic fall from grace. Yeah, I would have to hustle again. But what would I do? I would go back into the world of either employment, I'd go get a good job and I'd live very frugally. I'd save like a maniac and I'd be very quickly back where I was before, or I would go and start another business and I would just reiterate. And so there's a difference between someone who's young and someone who has backup options falling and that person can afford to be more risky than someone who doesn't. So age is not the only thing. Let me give an example, right? Uh, Along the the time in my financial career, I've had occasion to counsel people who've come into substantial sums of money, often through inheritance. 
And I remember the case of one guy a number of years ago um, who was uh, had been in prison. He had uh, finally gotten free of alcohol and drugs, uh, but he had had a significant ex- experience with alcohol and drugs. He was working at a very basic job, and then his dad died and left him quite a lot of money. Well, in that situation, I am I would never tell that young guy to go all in on something because going all in with a windfall, especially an emotionally impactful windfall like the the estate of your father, that's a very different scenario than going all in with your own money that you've saved and earned. And that's a very different scenario for someone who's gone through the hard work of saving and earning hundreds of thousands of dollars or millions of dollars versus somebody who's experiencing a windfall. My first comment to the guy with a windfall is do nothing. Second comment is diversification. And I would preach left, right, and center. Don't invest more than 10% in one opportunity. Don't do it. Don't do it. Because that guy hasn't proven um, himself to be the kind of guy who can generate money. Flip that on its head where you have a guy that comes along and says, you know, I've made half a million dollars here and I did it all from investing in, you know, this certain thing or I did it all from investing in a business and now I see an opportunity to go all in on the business and turn my half a million dollars into 50 million dollars. I'm going to tell him all day long, do it, go all in, put the half a million and work on the 50 million dollar plan um, because He's the guy who accumulated and developed the half a million dollars. And so I don't think there's a wooden rule of, um, I don't think there's a wooden rule that would show how much someone should diversify and how much they shouldn't. I think talking through the scenarios brings me to my final point. The important thing would be to analyze what is the worst case scenario. So the worst case scenario let's say of my $500,000 401k all invested in dollars. The US dollar is never going to become literally worthless, right? That's just not in any realm of feasibility. If it did become worthless, then the entire world is at war. And the only thing that is worthwhile is the amount of food that you have in your basement, the number of guns and the tens of thousands of rounds of ammunition, because if the U S dollar became worthless, there would be international global war and fighting in the streets. So you don't prepare for that by necessarily saying, I'm going to have 15 foreign currencies. Now, fast forward, maybe in the future, things might be different, but at the current in today's world, that's how I see things. And so, you look at how likely is a scenario and it's just not that same it's not that same way and so i don't tell the guy who is the uh, is is has a half a million dollars and he's earning in dollars and he has dollars i don't think he's stupid by having most of his assets in dollars i do want an escape policy i do want some money diversified out of dollars into foreign currencies into tangibles into something else uh, but most people have that in some in some form, and that's pretty easy to do. Then I look at it and I say, what's the worst case scenario? Maybe the worst case scenario would be a 20% slump, right? 30% slump. In today's world, with the centrality of a country like the United States, a 30% slump um, is an acceptable risk. Uh, it's not wipeout. It's just, it's un- very unpleasant. Now, that's different than if you are living in an economy that is not a major empire like the United States, right? Right now, active hyperinflation in Venezuela, Argentina, Lebanon, um, where else? Number of, uh, there'd be in Afghanistan, right? So if all your money is in in the, what is it, the Afghan dinar? I'm not sure what their their currency is called. But um, if all your money is in the Argentinian peso, you're behaving foolishly, right? You're really behaving foolishly because you have to look at it and say, the worst case scenario here is far, far different and than, than the worst case scenario for the US dollar right now. So the point is calculate the worst case scenario and ask yourself, am I willing to live with this? Uh, am I willing to, to, to accept this? I don't have a formula that captures all of that, but I believe that that's the appropriate way to answer the question of how aggressive should I be? How far in should I go?
Okay. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks, Joshua. Yeah. I think there's a lot of good points. Um, especially what you were saying about, um, you know, someone who has gone through the work of saving, investing and building up, um, some kind of, uh, some capital initially, it's, it's less of a deal for that person to go back and, and do it again. That, that's a good, uh, good point. Let me go on with one more example that I think does prove another point, and it's a practical example. In my time, when in the past I have uh, offered private consulting, uh, which, by the way, I intend to do again. Uh, I'm stationary enough now that I can do that again, so I am going to open that up again. And I've had a lot of emails inquiring about that. But in the past, when I've been able to offer private consulting, I have learned that I have more than a handful more than I've had consulted with clients, more than what can fit on one hand, uh, somewhere between five and 10 of my listeners in this audience who, who have become uh, Bitcoin millionaires. And I love it. I love it. These are guys who started with very little, but they believed in Bitcoin early on, and Bitcoin has been very kind to them. My favorite story is a, a client of mine who was working in a blue collar job. Uh, he was a single man, blue collar job. And for several years, he worked nonstop, taking every bit of overtime that he could. He was making six figures. He literally lived in his car, which was a compact car. And he put every dollar that he could uh, manage from living on nothing and working cr like a crazy man into Bitcoin. And so fast forward a few years, I had, I had uh, consulted with him a few years ago when he was in that process. Fast forward a few years with the massive growth of Bitcoin prices, his wealth had gone to from more modest to several million dollars. Now, the best example I could give is the advice that I gave to him. And what I, we tried to approach it in that scenario was what would be the impact of, of various scenarios. So if a guy goes from zero dollars of net worth to several million dollars of net worth, there is a major decline in going from several million dollars of net worth down to zero. It is very possible that the terminal value of Bitcoin is zero dollars. And it's possible that that happens very quickly, right? That could happen in a year, two years. For all you and I know, we could be in a scenario where in 2023, Bitcoin is worth exactly zero dollars. It's possible. It's far, it's improbable, but it's far more probable that that happens and that the US dollar is worth exactly zero dollars in 2023, at least in my estimation. Now, it's also possible and probable that Bitcoin goes from almost $50,000 to $500,000, right? There's no fundamental reason why it couldn't be that we couldn't measure one Bitcoin in the value of $500,000 of U.S. dollar fiat. So U.S. dollar tokens, uh, that's also possible. But if you think about the impact of going from a multimillionaire down to zero, versus going from a multimillionaire to a few tens of millions, there is a much bigger impact in, in going from multimillion to zero than there is from going from a multimillion to tens of millions. So my advice to this particular client was, let's talk about something like maybe a third, right? Move a third off the table and out of Bitcoin. Um, you may still believe in Bitcoin, but if you know that for the rest of your life, you never have to go, you never have to not be a millionaire, that's genuinely life changing because for the rest of your life, you have freedom. And so maybe you give up on the top side. Maybe if Bitcoin went to $500,000 per uh, US dollars per coin, maybe you instead only have $25 million instead of $35 million. That's not going to matter nearly as much as the risk of going from going down to zero. So when you look at it and you play these scenarios, you can be aggressive, but your aggressiveness has to change at different points depending on the various outcomes. 
that's the the fundamental point. I wanted to give an example to try to clarify it. Any additional comments to, on that, Thomas? All right, hearing none, we move on for our final call of the day to Indiana. Welcome to the show. How can I serve you today? Can you hear me? Yes, go ahead. Great. So um, first off, thanks for all that you do. Uh, your career and income course and, and your podcast have enabled me to um, get a 20% raise at my job. Woo, woo. And nice. so, <laughs> yeah, so. I've always admired your ability to break things down into um, uh, an accessible, digestible chunk. And I'm sort of in a very, I mean, I'm in a slump right now. Um, I have a five month old son. Um, I have a 70K job as a business analyst, a very, very flexible job, but work from home. Um, I'm also I have a side hustle, um, bringing about 15, 20K um, in the wedding music business. And what you mentioned this earlier about, you know, doing things that had low value in the long run. And I feel like I'm just in, I'd like to consolidate my career into something that's not dollars per hour. Um, you know, eventually get into, you know, hopefully real estate, but it seems like all of the, all the roadblocks in my life come down to income. Um, and so obviously I took the career income course. I didn't do any of the journaling exercises. Um, I, I find that I have, I'm sure my other people, you know, are, are the same way. We read a lot of books, you know, overanalyze things and a year later, nothing's been done. Um, so I'm just, I, it's so hard to resist that easy, you know, $500,000, you know, cash, um, where that sucks up a lot of my time where I could be focusing on a long-term career. So every time I go to research, you know, what, what I could do to make, you know, 200,000, by January of, you know, 2024, I just get bogged down in the research and I really, I, I don't get anywhere. And so I'm wondering if, how, how you would approach breaking this down in order to take some concrete steps forward. Your career as a business analyst, describe without giving any personally identifiable, identifiable information, describe to me what you're doing, for whom are you working, et cetera. Uh, I work for a local university. Um, I do basically process improvement, um, software implementations. I, I, did, I got into it sort of randomly. I actually have a degree in music. Um, and so I'm sort of dealing with uh, sort of a, what do they call it? Like an imposter syndrome to where when I look at somebody who's making, you know, 100K, oh, uh, project manager. I, I could never do that. Uh, or how does someone even get to 200K? Like, is it sales? Like, but, but uh, so that's, yeah, basically it's software. Good. Do you feel like the business analyst job is a good fit for you? Do you feel like it, it hits on some of your strengths? And while it may not be perfect, do you, do you, do you gain, gain a sense of satisfaction from it? I, I do. I'm a very analytical person. So being able to communicate, you know, more complex process flows is something I, I do like. But I, I've all, I feel like I've always suffered from being just naturally good at a lot of things. Um, and it's always led me to just not make any decisions about what to take a concrete step forward. in. And so I basically I have I have found myself here by following my strengths. Um, <clears throat> So obviously making a big, you know, making a big career change would, would take some pain in acknowledging weaknesses and really focusing. But I, I think that's where I'm really stuck right now. And like the, the new baby, that's sort of like, I feel like that's, you know, slowing me down in a way. But I know, I, I think as you said, like, just stop doing stuff like when you're, when your child is born until you can kind of get into a rhythm. And so I just feel like I'm, stuck in this place and I, I want you know for my family I want to be able to make it so that my wife who is a teacher can you know and not not feel like she has to work so the reason I ask about the business analyst perspective is as far as I can see that's a clearly straightforward career growth plan uh, and we don't have to be all that smart you don't have to be particularly imaginative you can easily easily parlay 
your $70,000 a year current business analyst job into, without question, a $270,000 a year business analyst job. And there's not a lot of room. That's, it's, a, it's a proven pathway. Now, the first thing I would do is I would probably drop um, the side hustle. Because especially with a newborn, I would think that the side hustle is possibly going to be with, with wedding music. So you're DJing uh, weddings and things like that? Uh, I'm a live um Life a live music performer. Okay. So ceremonies, cocktails. But Do you not, have, not whole in your analysis, is there any genuine breakout potential for you to make a lot of money as a musician? Beyond, I mean, beyond literally leaving the house and going out and making that income, uh, there, there's no way to scale it beyond, you know, say a max of, I don't know, 20, maybe 30, probably about 30 K. Right. Right. So it's like, yeah, that's right. So pretty much it. it. So if, if your honest, genuine analysis says that, um, that you probably are not going to break out in the music <laughs> business, then I would keep as, I would do as much of you want to do of it as fun you know, as a hobby and without question, certainly pay, you know, have people pay you money for your hobby, but I wouldn't give it any kind of serious development. Um, because I believe that there are many people who have and who will be able to use their musical talent and generate a fortune for themselves. Um, but mm. it's very hard to predict. And I, I don't know how you predict it. I, I don't know. I, I've never studied it enough to do it. If you thought if you thought you had some formula, then go for it. But I don't know how to predict it, and so I can't actually give any advice to it. I so yeah. That's, it, I mean that it's it's a weird beast, right? And it's I, I'm I, I'm actually not looking to be famous, right? To do that. I'm actually I was just looking to scale it as like an actual you know a business versus being a rock star. That's so I don't. Sense. I don't see any ability for that business to scale unless you can break out and actually achieve fame. If you can achieve okay. fame and notoriety, then that business can scale. So go and look at Rihanna, right? Rihanna is one of the youngest and fastest billionaires uh, because she parlayed her, her skill into branding, right? So you can do it. And the pathway is you achieve fame and notoriety and then you use that fame and notoriety in personal branding to sell products and services to your fan base. That's how the business works. Uh, so some of it can come from direct sales. Now, it can be a very comfortable business, right? If you were really had a great passion for it. I remember when I was in business school, we read a case study of the Grateful Dead, and they talked about how one of a, how, what a phenomenal job the Grateful Dead band had done of being these, in some ways, not well-known, uh, but yet providing their fans with all these things that made them a phenomenal living and built a really solid business, even though they were never just an international superstars. So I believe you can do it. I just think it's a very difficult road and a very hard-to-predict road, and it requires a tremendous amount of skill and a good dose of luck hitting something right and that hitting something right is unpredictable. So set that aside, right? Do as much music as you want to for fun. But what, what I can give you actionable advice on is the business, business um, analyst. And here, what I would say is, remember my three-part strategy that I taught in the course and that I've publicly stated many times about where to focus it. So what can you actually do to increase your wages when you work for wages? Number one is you can work more hours. That is not the path for you. You don't need to work more hours. What I would like to do is see you work fewer hours by cutting out the side business, unless it's fun, um, and investing those hours instead into number two and three. Number two is you can produce more work per hour. So the first thing I would do is I would look at your work that you're doing as a business analyst and I would say, are there any tools that you don't have that you could have? And this can be very, very simple, right? If you're a business analyst and you're working with a lot of spreadsheets, I would expect that when I walk into your home office, 
I find three giant curved monitors set up so that you can display every bit of information on three screens in front of you. Is that what your desk looks like? Uh, no, it's currently just a laptop. All right. You have significant room to invest into your tools. You should have a fast and current computer, and you should have three very large monitors arrayed in front of you. And that's step, that's 101. If you're, if you're, if you're a business analyst, you need the ability to have two spreadsheets on the monitor on the left. You need the ability to have your messaging in the monitor on the right. And you need the ability to have all of the documentation that you're reviewing on your monitor in the middle and for spreadsheets, for documentation, et cetera. The simple, most obvious, most proven productivity hack that you can possibly have is multiple monitors, very large. So get out of here with that working on a, on a laptop <laughs> thing. All right. Next. Look at okay. the skills and ask yourself, what are the skills that I am applying on a daily basis? Uh, I'm just going to run with, with some ideas. You, you translate these things later. But if I'm analyzing businesses and I'm involved in, in um, a lot of analysis of business finances, I'm going to ask myself, how well do I really understand how a P&L works? How well do I really understand um, the statement of accounts? How well do I really understand these spreadsheets? Uh, so maybe you need to dust up a little bit on your accounting. So I would grab uh, several books on accounting and I would read through, I would read through uh, financial analysis for dummies and I would take a course. I would practice some, some math. How well can I run a financial calculator? When I was a new financial advisor, I got a financial calculator and I sat down and I did drills and I would do drills. How quickly can I produce it? At this point, most of those things aren't relevant for me. So my, my skills have faded, but I got to the point where I could with nothing more than a financial calculator, I could run all of the projections. And that's just a simple skill. That's how you invest in doing more work more quickly. Uh, and you want to enhance your skills. You should be, at, if you analyze what you're actually doing, you should be able to look and, and, and say, what are the discrete skills that are necessary at each stage of this? And how can I invest into those? Usually it's going to be books, classes, and those are the primary books and classes. Uh, and so it's a, it's a course on how to use Excel. It's a course on how to use um, whatever projection software you use. Do those things. Now, the next bigger picture is to focus on producing work that's more valuable. And so there's a very good chance that the work that you're producing for $70,000 per year is exactly the same work that some of my clients are producing for $7 million a year just simply because they're working for a hedge fund and you're not. Now, I don't know, but the point is that the skills are the same. And so there's no reason why you can't go from $70,000 a year to $70 million. Sorry, well, $70 million, yes, but $7 million a year if you can figure out how to, how to upgrade your skills and then sell them to a higher bidder. And so the first thing that I would do is I would think about a job that was outside of my comfort range, but was achievable, right? Let's say you think of something like $200,000. And I would go and I would find and, and lay out for myself the job that I know where somebody is, is working as a business analyst or a, of some kind, and they're making $200,000. Do you know anybody who's doing something like business analysis, uh, investment analysis, et cetera, who's making $200,000 personally? No. In, in fact, that's really, that's one of the big questions I have is in, in the research that I've done, it, it seems like you have to have a, an extremely deep level of subject matter understanding or specialization within the field to, to command that sort of an income. But yeah, I, I certainly don't know anybody who's, who's anywhere near that. Okay. So you're right. You do. You absolutely do have to have a specialization. But the point is that that's something that's relatively easily acquired. Um, it's not, it's not complicated. It's not easy because it does take time. It takes study. It takes work, but it's not complicated to acquire. That's my point. So here, what I, here's what I would say. Okay. The first thing I would do, and this is, some of this is in the course, right? If I didn't know anybody who was making $200,000, I would look around and I would try to look through my contacts. I would look through my LinkedIn. I would go and I would ask someone. Um, there's, there's guaranteed there is somebody in your network who knows somebody like that. 
And so I'd ask myself, which of my friends is most likely to know somebody who works in some kind of business consulting, business analyst viewpoint, and then they can, uh, and then go and, and, uh, and I would ask my friend to introduce me to somebody. And I would say, I'd be very clear. Like, I wouldn't hide anything. Joe, listen, I want to make more money. And I'm trying to figure out what skills are missing in my life. I know, Joe, that you work in an insurance office. And I'll bet you you guys have some clients who, um, you know, who make a lot of money and are business or investment analysts or business analysts or business consultants, right? Then I would say to them, I would say, can you please introduce me to one of your clients or one of your friends so I can take him to lunch and say, like, what do I need to learn to be worth $200,000 a year? I would figure out a personal referral to somebody who knew somebody who I could go and I could say, and I would call him up and say, um, you know, I want to take, I, I want to earn more money. I'm currently earning $70,000 a year as a business analyst. My goal is to figure out how to prepare myself for a $200,000 a year job. And so I'm wondering, would you be willing to have lunch with me so I could ask you some questions on some of the things that I need to do? And I, 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 my guess is if you ask six people that, three of them will say yes, maybe four, maybe five. Wouldn't surprise me if four said yes, but at least three of them would say yes, and all you need is one. And then that starts you on the right, on the right path to someone to say, well, here's what I studied, here's what I learned. The other thing that you need to do, what I would do is, if you have some area of specialization, specialized interest, then I would focus a lot on, on drilling down into that. And then I would see, can I pick up my own clients, right? Simple things like marketing. Business, business, analyst is, business analysis is not complicated. There are only a few basic parts to a business, and this is a lot of us go back to the course content that I presented, right? I talked about the five five functions inside of a business. Now you pick one of those, and then you specialize in one of those, and then you and you apply that into the business function. So there's people out there right now who th their business model is so simple, right? What do they do? They learn how to run Facebook ads. They learn how to write very very basic Facebook ads and run them. They go to local businesses. And they charge local businesses $1,000 a month to run their Facebook ads. Doesn't take a ton of time. It's not that difficult for you to go out and you to find 10 local businesses to each pay you $1,000 a month to run their Facebook ads for their particular business. And that's a business that can be learned in, call it maybe 10 weeks, right? 10 weeks, five books, five courses, uh, and 10 weeks of practice, and you're in. Uh, and if you can run 10 clients like that, you can easily run 20, and there's your $200,000, $250,000 a year, depending on your expenses. So um, once you home in on an area of interest, then it's a matter of learning about it. And the process of learning about it is super simple, right? You take an area of specialization. What's an area of specialization that you personally have an interest in? In, in the functions of business? Um, I find that I'm, I guess I find that burgeoning industry of blockchain really fascinating as a future. Okay. So blockchain is an industry, but it's not a function of business. So, Oh, um, maybe you can help me out and, and Provide an example. All right, so a function of business would be something like marketing, sales, product creation, management, accounting. Um, I would say somewhere in between marketing and and sales, maybe okay. a little finance. But that, yeah, that's okay. You can start there. So any of these are fine. Okay. So what do you do? Right. Well, you say, okay, I'm interested in blockchain technology and I'm interested in marketing. So what do you do? Well, me, I go to Amazon, go to start a local library. You can do this for free, right? Go to your local library and check out every book that they have that has marketing in the title. My local library in the United States, you can check out 50 books. So I can get up to 50 books that have marketing. And I order from all of the other branches, I order them all sent to my thing, and I check out every book that they have on marketing. And then just take them home, flip them through. 
flip through one per night. Don't read, don't try to read them cover to cover, just flip them through, see the terms, see what's in there, et cetera. Look at the, the indexes in the back, get an idea of what this book is about, get an idea of what marketing means. So you have a clear idea of what in your head of what marketing means. Um, if you think some of them are good and you can identify the ones that are good, uh, I would also go to Amazon. I would type marketing in the Amazon search bar. I would look for the books that have the most ratings and the highest ratings on the subject of marketing. And I would buy five or 10 books on the subject of marketing. And then, uh, and that's my starting point. Second thing I would do is I would go to, uh, uh, podcast, whatever, where you listen to podcasts, I would search marketing and I would sign up for the five po marketing podcasts that seem, sound like they're the most interesting, uh, to me right now, uh, do the same thing on YouTube. Although in this case, pot audio podcasts are probably better because you get more, more content that is made for audio versus YouTube. Uh, but I would go to, uh, that as well. Then I would look for conferences or classes. And so I would try to figure out, is there a marketing conference? that is scheduled is there you know is there is there such a thing i would go to go to duckduckgo.com and i would ask the duck for marketing conference and i would just start looking through and is there anything near near me i would look around are there any marketing classes they have marketing classes at your local university i would go to one of the marketing classes just audit the class or sign up and pay for it take it etc um, but i would expose myself to stuff that's about marketing uh, then do the same thing with blockchain Say I'm interested in blockchain, so let me go to uh, let me go to Amazon. Let me buy five books on blockchain technology. Um, more importantly, with something like blockchain, uh, is let me go to Twitter and let me follow every account that I can find that's talking about blockchain technology. Follow the hashtags, follow the trends, etc. What I would do is I would go and I would pick a conference. Uh, this is what I do, right? So I go and I find the Bitcoin conference. Okay, here's the Bitcoin conference or the blockchain conference or whatever. Find a conference. Go through the list of speakers from that conference. And then you find that list of speakers. Take the list of speakers and go to Twitter and find their Twitter profiles. A lot of times they're listed on their bios on a conference page. But if not, just search for their name and you'll find them pretty quickly. Then what I would do is I would set up in TweetDeck. I would set up a list or just simply columns in TweetDeck for every single one of those um, speakers so that I can start following them. And if you don't have enough, then go and find another conference. And here's what I can guarantee you. Okay? The people who are speaking at a Bitcoin conference have already been vetted by the organizers of the conference. They're being brought because they represent something. They represent a, a, a le leadership position in this space, right? So if you're interested in blockchain and you're not following what Jack Dorsey says about Bitcoin or what Michael Saylor says about Bitcoin or what Elon Musk says about Dogecoin, right? You're just not, you're not serious. And so you start following them and you start, you start finding out what they're doing and then follow the trails down, right? They tweet out a link to an article, okay? Or, or an interview. All right, so-and-so interviewed Michael Saylor. Go and listen to the interview. Um, here's an article on a, such a topic on Medium. Go and read the article, find the author, follow them. So curate for yourself, around yourself, a group of teachers who are teaching you about the things that you are interested in. Then, when possible, when the ideas present themselves, you start to think about, is there a way that I can connect my interest in marketing with my interest in blockchain technology? And the answer is there's tons of ways that you can do it. Um, but you start looking and you start figuring out where do these things intersect? Where are the, where do they overlap? And then you look for opportunities within that. Look for job postings right now. If you become an expert on blockchain technology, um, quite literally, governments around the world will hire you to come and design their their sovereign cryptocurrency. Right, the world is desperate for blockchain um, consultants at the moment. Now, some of that may be more technical that you're interested in, but there are lots of options available. If you're interested in marketing, I would be studying all the ICOs and try to figure out like what makes a, a, a currency pop, what makes it not pop. Is there some way that I can be involved in something like that? Um, th there's just no limit to the number of options that are available to you. 
And so my answer is you surround yourself by this and you systematically look for opportunities and you systematically change your reference group till the point where it is that you're simply surrounded by people who are talking about nothing but blockchain and marketing. And then in the fullness of time, that will change who you are. You'll stop worrying about being an imposter. And if you'll do your homework, um, you'll study, right? You'll read the articles, you read the books, you take the classes, you'll listen to the seminars, you go to the conferences, you, you pay attention you'll and study them, then you'll be good to go. And, and just a classic thing, right? Every conf- If you go to a Bitcoin conference, then find the rec- buy the recording, and then that's what you listen to while you're driving back and forth to work. And if you go to one conference and you buy the recording and you listen to the recordings of that one conference, with that alone, you will be in the top, at least the top 20% of people in the industry. And you'll have a broad exposure. And then in the fullness of time, your brain, your creative brain, will either notice the opportunities that are present or will start to put the connections together and you start to have ideas. And then the key success skill to to train and to practice is notice the ideas that your brain has. Don't ever let an idea come into your brain and then leave again without writing it down. Pay attention to, to them. And surround yourself with means of taking notes so that you always have a capture device, right? My favorite ones is virtually all the time, I wear an Apple Watch. I have an app, my Apple Watch set so that I have the hot button. I have the, the, the complications with like, what is it? One, two, three, four, eight, like 10 complications, eight complications. One of them is voice memos. And so I can immediately at any point pretty much 24 seven, I have a watch on my wrist that has a voice memo recorder. So if I have an idea, I immediately hit voice memo and I record the idea. Phone, same thing. I have the hotkeys set on my phone. So at any point in time, I just swipe down, boom, new note, write down the note, write down the note, and then just process those. And if you train, then of course, all of the other ways of taking physical notes uh, to the point where literally go on Amazon and buy for yourself the little thing that goes in your shower that allows you to have a message board in the shower. I find that I think very well in the shower. And so buy that and stick it up on the wall of your shower. And if you start to pay attention to the ideas that your brain is generating while you are recording this, con- while you're listening to the content, then you become like this creative uh, master, th- this creative genius, able to simply notice what your brain is doing. And then as you notice, your brain gets better at doing it and gets better at doing it, gets better at doing it, and it's a virtuous cycle. And so you can do the hard work of preparing yourself now for the position that you want in the future, right? There's the old saying, dress for the job that you want to have. Well, that was probably more true in 1985 than it is today. Today, while I still think the principle applies, I think you should dress for the job that you want to have. It's a much more bewildering uh, landscape to know how to actually apply that when some of the wealthiest, uh, you know, the wealthiest men in the world wear a hoodie every day. That's a little bit more difficult. But what I do think is absolutely true is educate yourself for the job that you wish to have. Prepare yourself for the job that you wish to have. Put the hard work in for your, on, on yourself and do the homework And then if you'll do that, you'll be ready when the job emerges and presents itself. That's my answer. Okay. It seems like there's like sort of a two-part process where one, you're figuring out it is your actual interest. And then the next step is getting into the game, getting in that circle, just bathing yourself in those ideas. I think think where I struggle is I have a lot of general interests. And so... You know, on any given month, I might be interested in in something different. Do you uh, do you have any any thoughts on how to just like pick something and stick with it? I think I think I'm just like worried about closing doors. Um, I think I I've always struggled with this, so I'm wondering if you have any thoughts on that. I don't think it matters. I spent an hour today watching videos uh, and reading everything about a man who lives in a little cart that he built pulled by a sheep and he lives on the side of the road and he practices gorilla grazing. Basically the story is he's, he's, he's homeless by choice, right? He's not actually homeless because he built this tiny little, this tiny little, um, wagon to, to, to live in. 
Um, but basically, he wants to help uh, homeless people, and so he's like developing these technologies, and he figured out how to live uh, for free with with sheep. So he has four sheep, three uh, ewes, and one ram, and he has this little cart wagon contraption that he built that has his bed in it and his food and everything, and he grazes the sheep on free land, you know, the, the, the medians of roads and little fields. Uh, and then he milks the sheep uh, and he drinks the milk and he turns the sheep milk into various cheeses and various foods. And he lives basically camps nonstop in this little cart that's pulled by his ram. So like, I don't know how you could get more weird and off the wall than Joshua Sheets <laughs> spending an hour of his day to day learning about um, learning about some random thing like that. I found it fascinating. I thought, and I loved the guy was incredibly brilliant and incredibly well spoken. Looks like a total bum, but he's incredibly brilliant, incredibly well spoken, has a real passion for what he's doing. It's phenomenal. It's my Twitter feed, twitter.com slash Joshua Sheets. You can see I shared the link to the video. Point is that. I'm not scared of diversity of interests. However, diversity of interests has to be trained and focused in one specific area if you're actually going to make money. Um, I have figured out how to find a way for my diversity of interests to shine. Probably 20% of my audience because I just shared this weird, wacky little thing about um, the sheep, 20% of my audience will say, that sounds cool. And later they'll go look at my Twitter profile and look at the video that I shared. It's super cool, right? But that works in what I'm doing. But, but that diversity of interest is not in and of itself uh, some, a, a, a virtue unless you can find a way to profile it. So if you want to be a podcast host and be able to speak extemporaneously on all kinds of weird things, then you can cultivate the diversity of interests. Otherwise, I think you have to p you pick something that's the top of the list, and then you go deep on that. Because at the end of the day, people pay for their solutions. You didn't call me, you didn't pay me money, and then to buy my courses, and then call me because you really were interested in finding out that there's a guy who lives with four pet sheep and lives on the side of the road. You're looking for solutions. And so if I don't have the ability to go deep on the financial stuff and the 30-minute speech that I gave you that's full of actionable packed stuff, then none of it really matters. So you've got to pick something. What I tell you, though, is you don't have to pick something and be that way forever. Just pick whatever seems like the best opportunity now. Go deep on that. Pay attention to the other interests. Uh, and then move on to the next thing when you think the time is right. And then if you'll just be a little thoughtful about choosing things that are useful, then it builds your talent stack, right? To use Scott Adams' phrase, which I think there's nothing better, right? It builds your talent stack. And you don't know exactly where that takes you until down the road it actually emerges uh, with the benefit of hindsight. So pick one thing to focus on and then discipline yourself to go deep on that area. Uh, pick blockchain and marketing. Discipline yourself to read 10 books on blockchain, 10 books on marketing. Discipline yourself to listen to 10 channels or 10 podcasts on those topics just systematically over time. And then if you want to do something else, then write it down and say, okay, I'm now changing and just develop the ability. You got to discipline yourself in the direction you want to go is the point. So I'm not scared of diversity of interest, but you got to specialize if you're going to make progress. That makes perfect sense. Thank you very much. My pleasure. I think you got good options. I'll tell you, the blockchain industry is wide open right now. Everybody is desperate for anybody who knows anything about it at all. Uh, and it's only getting started. So don't think that you're late to the game, but do the homework and then look for it. And so if you're good at being a business analyst, excuse me, if you think that you're good at being a business analyst, great. Um, there's a whole world available to people for being a, a crypto analyst. Uh, there are tons of options. And today, you don't need anyone's permission. You just simply decide what you want to do and you do it. So go for it. Thank you so much for listening to today's show. That is it for today's podcast. I'll be back with you very soon with another episode. Remember, if you would like to be here for next week's Q&A show, go to patreon.com slash radicalpersonalfinance and I would love to have you on the next episode.